Dr. Uchenna Ume is a pediatrician who has lost people to suicide. She saw this as a growing issue among her patient population, so she left the stability of her medical practice because she felt she could do greater good reaching out to larger groups. We discuss her recommendations for recognizing characteristics of depression and suicidality, how to start the discussion about such a sensitive issue if we suspect it, and why we should start discussing that issue even if we don't suspect it. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. Those on this podcast accept no liability for the outcomes of medical decisions based on this information. As the radiologists like to say, clinical correlation is required. This is not medical advice, and this does not constitute a physician-patient relationship. If you have a medical problem, seek medical attention. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Welcome back to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. On today's episode, we have Dr. Uchenna Ume, also known as Dr. Lulu, by her patients and online. She's a pediatrician who used to practice out of San Antonio, Texas, until she decided to follow her passion, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, Dr. Ume, thank you so much for being on the show today. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm excited. So first, just talk to us about your education, medical school, residency, and your journey from there. So I was born in Nigeria. I'm Nigerian by birth, naturalized American. And um, my first, I don't know, 20-something years of life were in Nigeria. I think 25 years. I went to med school in Nigeria, in the northern part of Nigeria. It's The school is called Amado Bello University. We have a British medical system, so it's seven years of med school. And then I graduated and then I, I, um, I did a mandatory internship in a, what they call a youth service corps, which is essentially one year given back to the government. And it's like a military-based training, but you still work as a doctor, but you get the training part of it. And then after that, I um, I worked for one more year while I was taking my exams to come to the U.S. to do my residency. So I got here like in 94 and started residency in 95. And I did my three years of pediatrics at Howard University Hospital. And then after I graduated, I literally started my own practice within the first year of graduation because I came in with what they call a J-1 visa, which allows you to, to is, an, is a student exchange program. So it allows you to train and then ideally you should go back to your country of origin or if you're going to stay behind, then you have to have a, um, you have to work in an underserved area for X amount of years. So I couldn't really find an underserved area. So I just started my practice in an underserved. I mean, I couldn't find a practice to hire me in an underserved area. So I started my practice in an underserved area. And so I did that for in the Lancaster County of South Carolina for about 13 years. After that, I got um, divorced. And so that was the reason for just kind of deciding, okay, what am I going to do now? I have three little boys and I, I need to get out of the area because it just wasn't the same for me anymore with the divorce and all that. And um, so I sold my practice and I joined the Air Force and um, as a lieutenant colonel, came in as uh, the commander over at Maxwell Air Force Base and had to quickly learn something totally, I think I used different part of my brain while I was in the military because everything was so new to me, but it was good. It was great. Actually, I enjoyed it. I asked to be stationed here in Lackland because of the weather and also because they have a, a medical a GME medical training program and I wanted to to teach residents and medical students and all of that. So that was fun. But as you know with the military or if you don't know with the military you have to move a lot. And so I'd already done a couple of what they call manning assists, which means I'm gonna to go to a different location where they have a shortage. But I went by myself the entire time. However, my oldest son was coming up on age to go to college and I needed to be home for him for that transition. And so I had to decide if I was going to stay or leave. And I had to decide to leave because um, boys don't, they don't bounce back too quick, too well. So I decided to just 
basically leave. And so I turned in my papers and I did my four years and got out. And I started working at a, a ginormous group practice here in San Antonio. It has like 13 locations and a whole bunch of doctors. Now, while I was in private practice, my very first patient that completed suicide, we're going to call him Miguel, came to see me with his mother. His mom suspected that he was using drugs, and that was her concern because as a quarterback in the school, he was just not acting like himself. So after speaking with him and doing the PHQ-9 and speaking with his mom and speaking with him some more, I realized that he was depressed. His, his scores were 23 out of 27, and which is basically major depression. But his mom kind of thought differently. She thought, I had depression when I was a teenager. I did okay. I think he's going to be fine. And um, I wasn't able to convince her to start him on medication or get any kind of therapy. And so that was in March of 2008. And then July 4th of that year, in front of the family during their barbecue, 4th of July barbecue, he put a double-barreled shotgun in his mouth and pulled the trigger in, in the front yard. So I, I'll never forget that picture and his mom just coming to me and just both of us having a good cry and just um she had only two children a boy and a girl so that was my first encounter with a patient suicide but before that i had had a friend of mine a close friend a surgical resident a nigerian doctor in 2000 who had basically done something similar and um but i didn't i didn't think too much of it as far as you know, if she wasn't my patient, it was bad because it put me into premature labor with my second son, but it still wasn't like my patient. But my patient completing suicide was like a major wake-up call for me. I'm like, okay, that didn't go too well. But, you know, it, it didn't happen again, thankfully, and hasn't happened again. But while I was in the Air Force, I noticed a lot of my patients were cutting and suicidal and threatening and one girl jumped from, a, I think it was a five-story building. She survived. Another kiddo took a friend's mother's bag of Xanax and slept for 36 hours. And then I had a girl that just cut, cut her entire stomach. Just different stories. And, and I thought it was the military. I thought it was a stressful environment, you know. Parents are deployed. It's it's hard. They're moving around a lot. But when I got to the private practice, it did not stop. It continued. And so I think it peaked last May when I had an eight-year-old boy come in to see me who had attempted suicide twice. But before that, I realized that every single day I was getting about a patient or two. I thought it was a patient or two. But my nurse said, no, doc, it's like two or three or sometimes even four patients who are depressed and suicidal. So I thought it was me. I'm thinking maybe there's something about me. Maybe I'm attracting them or maybe I'm misdiagnosing them or overdiagnosing. And then I started asking and everybody was like, oh yeah, we're noticing that also increasing. I'm like, wait, wow, that's crazy. So I approached my superiors and asked them if I could get one day off during the week to go and just talk at the schools was my first instinct and see if I could... Maybe rather than talking to 20 kids a day in the office, I can talk to 200 kids or 2,000 in an assembly at school. And my superiors didn't like that. They were like, no, we need you here five days a week. We don't have that option for you. And so I had to do the unthinkable, which is basically say, well, I still live the baby. I have, to, I have to do this because it was just pulling and pulling and just nonstop. And so that's kind of how I started um, speaking. And so now I, I speak at schools, middle schools, high schools, elementary schools, YMCA. I've spoken to resident doctors. I've spoken to doctorate students. Next week, I'm speaking to some undergrads at UT Austin. I'm just speaking wherever they will have me. I'm going to go talk about this major, major problem that we're having. So I'm not only addressing teens, I'm addressing parents, I'm addressing young adults, I'm addressing tweens and, and even elementary schoolers. Because if you look in the news, you will see the recorded on record, the youngest child has completed suicide was five. So it's not as 
uncommon as we think. And as of 2016, there was a study that was actually published in the New York, I want to say New York Times, was published last year in New York Times, where the study was done in 2016. And they found that African-American children aged 5 to 11 are twice as likely as their Caucasian counterparts to complete suicide. So it's not even like rare and it's not like, you know, unusual anymore. It's happening every day. Unfortunately, we don't want to talk about it. So what are some of the lessons that you've learned in speaking about this and from your practice that you wish you had learned either in medical school or your residency training that you want to pass on to the listeners about this topic? Uh, Quite frankly, I think it might be a sign of the times. I went to school in the 80s. There wasn't too much child suicide. Plus, I went to school in Nigeria. So maybe I would have wished that I was better prepared for now, but there's no way I could have because it just, it was, it's alien. Now, in Nigeria today, there are more and more people committing suicide, completing suicide. I have to remind myself to say the word complete and not commit. But there are more and more young adults. And I get inboxes. There was one recently last month, a young girl who was in college. Coincidentally, she went to this, she was attending the same college that I went to for med school, who had hung herself. And so it's becoming more mainstream, but it's still the exception in Nigeria. So that's a different world altogether. In the U.S., when I went to Howard, when I did my residency, I did not have a single child that was even attempting suicide. It was not something that was just mainstream then. Now, fast forward to today's world with just the proliferation of cell phones and social media. And recently on YouTube, there have been lots and lots of cases of children watching on YouTube suggestive videos. And I one that I saw myself, the gentleman walks in just randomly and says, kids, remember, this way for attention, this way for results. So it's not, it's a different world completely. There's nothing that anybody could have done in the 80s when I went to med school to prepare me for 2019. Well, then what what is it that you'd hope to pass on then to current residents and current med students and make sure that it's being covered. So clearly it's a huge problem, but what can we do to start identifying it and addressing it? I think the the main thing, just like anything else, you know, I tell my son, every time you buy a new car, once you start driving, you see the car everywhere. He's like, wait, I didn't know there was this many blah, blah, blah. So now that we're seeing it more and more, I think the, the, the residents, the first thing they should do is definitely think about it. Because if you're not thinking about it, then you're not even going to ask those direct questions like, are you being bullied? When you see that one child has come to see you three times in a row for a leg pain that is not getting better or a stomach pain or a headache, any kind of somatization, think, could that child be bullied? Could that child be having psychological problems? Is there something else? Before you just say, oh, he's, he or she is seeking attention, it may be a cry for help. Whereas when I was younger, I would have probably maybe said that, a younger self of mine. But now I'm like, maybe, maybe. But the best thing to do is to come out and ask the question and examine and, and examine your patient and indeed interview them alone. A lot of things can be gotten from the child when you interview them alone. You have to Tell them, though, that, listen, I'm here to help you. I am your advocate. However, if you tell me something that is life-threatening, I will have to tell your parent. I will have to make your mother aware of it because there's life and death. Because most children, most adults even, who complete suicide, for those who have been interviewed, who are tempted and didn't die, they tell you that at the moment that they want to jump off the bridge or at the moment when they do whatever, they regret it. They really don't want to do it. They really don't. But most of them feel invisible. They feel unheard. They feel like no one knows them. No one sees them. And so you have to make them believe you, that you see them, that you know them. Even if you haven't walked that walk, 
You don't have to have empathy. You can have compassion. And I know empathy is important, but empathy, I think, is it empathy? One of them is the one that you, you have to have gone through it. I think it's empathy. Or you don't have to have felt it, but you have to kind of feel it even though you haven't experienced it. I think that's empathy. You just have to convince them that, look, even though I haven't been through this, this is real. And you can, the, the life is, your life is so young. You have the whole world ahead of you. You do not have to do this. You have to convince them. However, whatever it takes, because that may be the last time you see that child. And then you don't want to be stuck with what else could I have done? So I say, think about it. That's the key thing. Think about it. No matter what the symptoms are, put it, have it at the back of your head that what if my next patient has suicidal ideation? What if? And if you think about it, then you, you will not, it, I don't know, it's just going to be there in your mind and then you ask the right questions. And then it may or may not be the situation, but at least you want to leave no stone unturned because that one stone is one stone too many. So you recommend, one, it has to be on your radar. And two, if you do discuss it, you have to be frank about it. No beating around the bush. No, you have to be very clear about what you're discussing and why you're discussing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know the good thing about this? Most people do think that if you have a discussion about suicide with your children, it suggests suicide, but actually it doesn't. So the good thing about it is studies have shown that discussing suicide with your child does not make them become suicidal. It doesn't. However, a little seven-year-old who doesn't know any better, whose brain is just trying to watch a video, simple video game, and then you come in and say, remember kids, this way and then that, that might plant the idea in their head, but that's where you as a parent come in. And that's why most of the people that I actually work with are the parents, because I do believe that somewhere along the line, if a child knows that their mother has an open door, their father has an open door, they are available to them. If they know that, they will at least think about you before they do stuff that's going to hurt them. And I'm proud to say that my children, for the most part, come to me. The hardest things, they come to, my son is a junior at college. He comes to me and tells me when he's down. And I, I, I may not fix it, but at least I can listen and I can tell him my opinion and I can ask, do you want my opinion? He says, no, I just want you to listen. Then I just listen. Or do you want my opinion? Yes, ma'am. And then I tell him my opinion. But let them know that you're there for them. And as a provider, you are basically a parent at work. So you have to also be, that's why I say I'm a momatrician because I'm a mother to those patients. And sometimes they tell me stuff, as you know, that they won't tell their parents. And then my job is to say, listen, this is a safe zone. I will tell your mother and nothing, nothing will happen as long as it's something that's life and death, life-threatening. So let's say it isn't life-threatening, right? But you are encountering some mental health issues. And certainly there are stigmas against that. And it, it can be a, a difficult thing to discuss. What are some of your recommendations for, for even just starting that conversation, right? Because you might have parents that are resistant to the idea that their child is having mental health issues. So how do you start it and how do you get past some of those challenges? I think for me personally, majority of my patients are resistant. Majority of my non-patients are resistant. When I quit my job to do this, a couple of my colleagues who are doctors, like family practice doctor friend of mine, took me to lunch and was like, have you lost your mind? He was like, are you trying to be a therapist? Like, I said, no, I'm not. But we have to see that we're all laborers in the same vineyard. So most of my patients are resistant. But basically what I do is I, I, I go to the, as granular as I can get. And I asked them questions if they've seen in the news lately. And they're like, yes, I have. I said, okay, you do realize that, yes, I know that child is not your child, but that child goes to school with your child and your child could be next. And the fact that your child could be next is enough for you to take this seriously. And no, you're right. Every, every child is not, every situation is not life and death. But the fact that most parents just assume that it's not going to happen to me is the problem. And so what I tell them is, assume it's going to happen to you. And then, then 
you can be that much more prepared and have the conversation. Look, if somebody has been diagnosed with diabetes, what they do is they call all their friends who have diabetes and ask them about diabetes. If someone has been diagnosed with cancer or kidney disease, they call all their friends or they look it up or whatever. But for some reason, when it's mental illness, they don't want to talk about it. And that's why the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention has one of the hashtags as talk saves lives and silence kills because of that stigma of not wanting to talk about it. And that's why I talk about it. And I talk about the fact that I have been depressed. And I tell my parents, yes, it was a reactive depression. It was after I got divorced and after I had to sell my practice, but it was bona fide depression. I had to be put on medication. So I have been suicidal myself. So it's not something that happens to only those kind of people or these kind of people. Doctors, as you know, are the numero uno people now, fastest, have fastest growing, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Profession. Profession, thank you. That is doing, we're making our own mark in the suicide department. I know five doctors now, total. That's five too many. And that's just me, just one person. Imagine how many you know and how many your friends know. And so it's the same thing. We have to look it in the eye. That's the only way that I know. That's the only way that I know. I accept it, embrace it, and talk about it. And the more we talk about it, the better we're going to get. As a matter of fact, the WHO had, I think in 2017, they said stigma is the number one public health crisis. The stigma of mental health, not the mental health itself, the stigma around it. And so people like me and you, you have a platform, you're talking about it, you're asking people questions, people start bringing it to the surface. I know everybody feels like their own cause is like the main cause. But unfortunately, when a seven-year-old, when a nine-year-old, when an 11-year-old, when a 14-year-old completes suicide, you have to believe that it is a major problem. Because what kind of world are we leaving for them? What about the future? Who is going to be in the future if all of them are completing suicide? So we have to put our feet down and be really like almost aggressive to the point of saying, listen, this is happening too much and just we need to stop. So I say, be, just remember that it happens. Depression is 100% treatable. Bullying is a major, major factor. Social media is a major, major factor. And once you know those four things, I think you know, if you're going to battle, you have to prepare yourself. So the only way to fight this is to know the facts. And they're everywhere. Just look in the internet. In the internet, you see the numbers. That nothing is made up. Every 40 seconds, someone completes suicide. That's a lot of people. If, in, if there was any other kind of disease, any kind of virus that was killing people every 40 seconds, there would be a global march about that. But because it's suicide, no one is talking about it. So that's how the stigma gives it power. Exactly. So one, one thing that I like to bring up on this podcast is that we all have our own specialties, but we're all physicians. And that, and that we're physicians, frequently people will turn to us for things that may be outside of our specialty. So what would you say to like a neuroradiologist or an anesthesiologist who doesn't see children in, in their practice, but they have children, their children have friends, and let's say they notice one of those friends may be having some mental health issues. What do you think they should do? Yeah, I think it's only fair for us to go back to that neuroradiologist when he went to med school. And that's why I believe that the medical school curriculum right now, today, maybe not yesterday or last week or last year, but today, every single medical curriculum should address child suicide, teen suicide, young adult suicide, adult suicide as a major, major major topic and incorporate that in the training such that even the neuropsychiatrist who never sees kids, he at least he remember when, when he was in med school that he said, child suicide is on the rise. And when you see one, you know one. And there's a online, there's something called the PHQ-9, which is the modified 
PHQ9 is a, is, a, is a questionnaire. It's very easy. You can download it and you can use that. And once the child scores, I mean, it tells you the scores, but if it's mild, moderate, and severe depression, right there and then, you say, ma'am, you know what? I know you came here because you have a headache and whatever, whatever, but I think your child also has a pretty significant issue with depression and I think it deserves to be tackled. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I definitely recognize it and I would like for you to be referred to a psychiatrist. I would like to refer your child to a psychiatrist because if you if you wait for them to go see their regular, if you say, okay, I would like for you to see a regular doctor who will now send you to the psychiatrist, you have a chance that first, they're not going to follow up with a regular doctor. And second of all, that child is lost to follow up. So right there, that visit is when you should start it. And if you call any of your psychiatrist friends, Thankfully, if you mention the fact that I think this child has got some mental illness, right there and then most of them will make an appointment and try to get your child, that patient in. And if it's your neighbor's child, same thing. So you know what? I know I'm not a, I know I'm a surgeon and I know you're going to think this is funny, but little, little Michael, I heard him say something the other day that I thought was, I think we need to know about. I think that parent looking forward will thank you immensely for telling them that you noticed something about their child that potentially could be life and death than if you didn't. And then after the fact, something has happened and you're like, you know what? Yeah, I did notice that the last time he was in the house, but I just didn't want to tell you. I mean, how do you want to, how do you think that's going to go down? So I'd rather... It sounds like the recurring theme here is the frankness, right? No beating around the bush, just go right to the heart of the matter, discuss the mental health issue, ignore the stigma, Right. Don't give the stigma power by by not being direct about it. But whatever situation you're in, be very clear about what you're talking about, why you're talking about it and just talk about it and just talk about it. And that's why I I came up with a mnemonic for talk, because I think, honestly, I believe that talk saves lives. So my mnemonic is T is for tell someone, because I know we're talking to doctors, but even doctors, too, they have bad days. But those don't last. You have to just believe that they're not going to last. Talk to yourself. Tell someone that you don't feel good. Tell them. Because once a problem shared is a problem halved. You know what? I really don't feel good over the past few years, a few days, whatever. I've been feeling really kind of bad. I don't know. Maybe I need a mental health day. And the more you talk about it, the more people will start talking about it. But the, the less we talk about it, the worse. And then A is for allow yourself those days when you don't feel so good. It's okay to not be okay sometimes, but it's just not okay to stay that way. So allow yourself to go there. And then L is love yourself. You got to love yourself enough to want to help yourself first. Because we're talking about children. It sounds like it's vague, it's out there. But what about ourselves, physicians? We're the hardest on ourselves. So love yourself enough so you can live your life to the fullest. And then K is knowledge. Learn about it. Learn the signs of depression. It's, in the, it's online. Look it up. Know everything about it because your child might be next. You may not be talking about a patient. It may be your own child. And you want to know that sometimes the child is just withdrawn. Sometimes the child is... I had a patient's mom who noticed that her child had rope marks around his neck. And he told her that it was the, from the pool. And she believed him. Well, he was playing the choking game. That is like, what? It's like, you can't believe anything they say when you see rope marks around their neck. But these are the things that they do. These are the challenges that teens are doing now. All kinds of crazy challenges. It's called the hang, hanging challenge. What is that? I, have, I have not heard of that. <laughs> but it's real. Yeah. So what other online resources or online or otherwise, right? K is knowledge. So what other what are specific online resources that you might recommend, including your own, right? Where where tell us where people can find you online. But even before where you can find me, there's a there's a free app. It's called the Not Okay app. It's got a red um circle and a cross across it saying not it has the word okay and then it's crossed out not okay. I love that app. It was actually developed by a 15-year-old and her 11-year-old brother because the little girl was having issues with mental health and her brother was a little techie. And they came up with this now is a free app. And what that app does is you install it in your phone 
and in the phone of your loved ones. And if they ever, ever are not okay or feeling like hurting themselves, they have to just type the word not okay into the app. But what you've done before that is you've installed five names of trusted family members or I don't know, teacher, counselor, whatever, cousin, uncle, mom, five names that you trust. And once a child types, I'm not okay into the app, it blasts that to the five pre-selected people with the GPS location of where that child is. So somebody will know where you are and they're going to come and get you. I love that app. I just, when I discovered it, I was just so happy that there's such a thing. Most people don't know about it, but it does exist. And then as far as my website is www.teenalive.com because I do believe that I can save one teen at a time. So it's teen alive and not teens, which people think is teens alive, but it's teenalive.com. I'm on almost all the social media platforms. I'm not as active anywhere else except Facebook, but I mean, I am there. If you Google me, you'll find me. I'm not too far away. And that's about it. I just want most people to know that the more you talk about it, the better it's going to be. You know the funny thing? Let me add one thing. Most people who, at least our patients that I talk to, say, no, I'm never going to commit suicide. I'm never going to complete suicide. Oh my God, I'll never kill myself. Then I ask them, do you have diabetes? They say yes. And I say, when was the last time you saw your doctor for your sugar? Oh, I don't know. What was your last hemoglobin A1C? Oh, maybe 12 So when was the last time you took your medication like you're supposed to, or even ate like you're supposed to? Oh, doc, you know, I I try. So what they're doing is slowly (laughs) completing suicide. No, it may not be instantaneous, but the truth is almost all those chronic diseases all end up with depression anyway. So the sooner you know that this is going to be in the radar, and the more you know that your providers are not going to judge you, your nursing staff are not going to judge you. Your parents are not going to judge you. When I was suicidal, I told my wife, I said, oh my God, I just think, I mean, it's maybe more than this, but when I said the words to her, she was like, not on my watch. And then she stopped what she was doing, called in sick. And we, she took me to my favorite place to be in Austin, Texas. But the point is, she made it a point of duty to say, no, no, right now you feel this way, but I promise you, it's not going to be that way tomorrow. And, and that's what I want people to do. Because what you say to the person who says, I feel bad, is more important sometimes or just as important as what you don't say. Like, you don't want to say, oh, you're just kidding. You're not really going to kill yourself. You don't ever want to say that because you might be the only person that they mustered enough courage to speak to. So it's very powerful if someone... For the most part, kids are not going to talk to their parents anyway. But if they do, if you do get lucky enough and your child tells you such a thing, you must take it extremely seriously because they may never tell you again. Yeah, it might be the only opportunity. Yes, the only window. Mm -hmm. So I just also want to give you an opportunity to, to talk about your book. Oh, my book. Oh, thank you. So it's called How to Raise Well Rounded Children. And the story behind that is. I noticed in my clinical practice, majority of my parents want to know, well, so what do I have to do with little Johnny to make sure that he doesn't grow up to be X or doesn't grow up to be Y as far as like, just to grow up right. And so I got enough people asking me those questions. I said, you know what, let me put down 16 guiding principles that I have found that work for me over my 21 years of being a a parent. And also some nuggets that I got from from my friends that I think I like the way they're raising their kids. And I wanted to know what they do. So it's called How to Raise Well-Rounded Children. And it's available on Amazon as well as on my website. So um, thank you for for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. No, of course, of course. And thank you for taking the time to, to talk to us here. I'll make sure that I, in the show notes, link up to the to the app that you mentioned, the Not Okay app and the PHQ-9 so that people can find those easily as well as all of your Teen Alive and your other social media links. So you, <laughs> your book, you're also, I know you're doing telehealth, you are speaking, you are extremely busy. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this very important topic of uh, teen suicide. And, and I think we all have a lot to learn from you. So thank you very much. 
You're very welcome. I hope I've been able to just light the spark. I think that's what I want to do. I just want to be able to light the spark that will make you sit down across the table and ask your child, do you ever feel like you're better off dead? You have to come out and ask. I know it sounds powerful. And the reaction hopefully will help you know, okay, it's all right. But there's a patient, there's a, there's a story about a little girl who's called Alexandra, I think Avalos or something. She was an all-star student. She did every single thing. She got straight A's. I mean, it was a huge surprise to her parents. But she had a journal, 200 pages of this journal that all she had was self-loathing, self-loathing, self-loathing. And then she just went one day and jumped off the side of the road and to her death. And her parents were just as shocked. So even though sometimes there's a sign. I think sometimes also there's no sign. And so we need to be prepared for the fact that sometimes even with the best intentions and best attempts, you might not know, you might still be surprised. And so hopefully that's not going to be our portions, but it does happen. Very powerful stuff. Very powerful. Again, thank you very much for your time. It's been very enlightening. I appreciate it. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.